I'm director here at um, I oversee our programming initiatives, and I hope that it's okay that we are recording the presentation today. If it's okay with you, please give me a thumbs up and I can continue. Great, thank you. So um, ensuring positive mental health is a health equity issue, and it is advancing health equity. And as all of you are familiar, um, advancing health equity is a core pillar here at CHC. Um, factors such as inability to access you know, affordable therapy, or positive mental health resources continue to widen that mental health gap that we see, right? And so access can start by a lot of workplaces and employees assessing and adjusting their policies to ensure that their employees are um, experiencing positive health outcomes in their work spaces. So everyone here today, our board members, our nonprofit partners are taking a step in creating this experience for, you know, your you know, workplace or folks that you interact with all the time by taking part in the information that we'll be joining today. Um, today's programming is on mental health impacts of bias, racial trauma, and structural discrimination for young people of color along racial healing strategy, strategies and resources for workplace and everyday life. And you all might be familiar with the suicide rates among young people here in the United States today, um, and they're pretty high. Um, it's the second it's the second leading cause of death among young people ages 15 through 24. Also, uh, for young people who experience any racial discrimination, those rates are further exacerbated. For folks who experience racial discrimination in their workplaces, those rates are further exacerbated as well, and they're more likely to experience adverse mental health outcomes. So I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Rivera and our Steve Fund friends, who will share a little bit about the program today, and then we'll get into it. Really quickly, if you look at your agenda, there's a link and a QR code because we are techy and modern. And for some of the interactive activities, you'll be able to scan the QR code to make sure you are able to participate. So I will pass it over to you, Dr. Rivera. Thank you so much for setting the stage for our conversations today. Am I coming in clearly? Yes. yes. All right. Um, those that are on... The uh, webinar joining us virtually also let us know if you're having any issues with um, audio or visual. Um, I am Dr. David Rivera. I'm a national advisor with the Steve Fund, and I've actually been with the Steve Fund since its inception, I believe back in 2014. You know, we're almost at 10 years of being an organization. Um, we have grown to be a pretty mighty force in the world of mental health, in the world of higher education and mental health, and now growing more work in, in the, the world of work in the corporate, nonprofit, governmental uh, sectors. So I'm here to share some about the work that we do, and I'm also going to give you some very specific examples of how we do the work as well. So we're going to be focusing on racial trauma in the workplace setting. So that's going to be the context. So please kind of frame yourself in that context of the workplace. Place. It could be your current workplace, previous workplaces. We know that those experience all have an impact on our present. So let's kind of ground ourselves in the, the world of, of the workplace. A little bit more about myself. I am a counseling psychologist by training. Um, I have been working primarily in higher education for over two decades at nearly every type of institution you can think of, two-year, four-year, private, um, highly elite, um, Ivy, public, land grant, urban, suburban, rural, um, it kind of spans the gamut, and I've also had some experience working in the foundation world and doing quite a bit of consulting uh, with corporations and governmental agencies. So I bring all of those experiences with you. My worldview is going to inform how we discuss racial trauma. I'll be using myself as an example time and time again. Um, I'm Mexican-American from Wyoming, multi-generational Latino from the Southwest from when it was actually part of Mexico, so that's part of my racial history. I also identify as gay. I grew up poor. I was first generation going college student. All of those are some of the primary lenses that kind of inform how I interact with the workplace, given some of the oppressions and some of the privileges that I experience via those lenses. So I also um, uh, encourage you to think about your various social identities and which ones are more salient when you're in the workplace and which ones maybe aren't. That can give you an indication of possibly how you're experiencing the workplace. I'm currently a professor of counseling at Queens College and the wonderful City University of New York System, the largest urban institution in the country, uh, where there's a lot of magic that can happen, but also a lot of bureaucracy that can happen. But anyhow, um, that's where I'm coming from. I'm calling in from Brooklyn, uh, which were the original um, lands of the Lenape people, and I want to acknowledge that. Um, it is uh, because of their original care that we're able to kind of occupy some of the lands that we are all occupying in this day and age. 
And it's important to kind of acknowledge that racial history that, that we are all um, connected to and a part of. So some of you may already know about this defund. If not, you're going to know a lot about this defund. Um, Stefund.org is our website. So that's where you can find a lot of information about what we do and how we do it, including a resource center and some interactive spaces for young people and families. We're growing and growing our organization, as was mentioned. And one of our priorities is that our resources are accessible, that they're elegant, meaning that they're kind of easy to understand and communicate, and that they're practical, right? They have some kind of meaningful application in a variety of settings. So the Steve Fund arose out of tragedy. The, the Belrose family, um, uh, whose son was Steve, um, uh, died of uh, mental health issues. Um, and when he passed away, he'd been dealing with some mental health issues for some time. Uh, when he passed away, the family came together and as part of their healing, they realized that there really weren't a whole lot of resources out there to help families grieve in general, but especially, especially for Black families and families of color. There weren't culturally relevant, culturally competent resources to help Black families grieve and kind of deal with issues regarding mental health, and they realized that was a large issue. And so this family, with all their resources and their, their, their immense knowledge, they put that together, and within a month, the idea of the Steve Fund arose. Um, that spring, that fall after um, Steve passed away, we had our first convening at Brown University, which was a multidisciplinary, multi-generational um, kind of gathering, small gathering. I was lucky to, to be there. And we started to discussing what's going on around the country. What do we know? And more importantly, what don't we know? We realized it was a whole lot that we didn't know. And so um, those efforts kind of galvanized to kind of create what um, has become the Steve Fund that we're presenting to you today. And so our mission is to kind of make sure that um, every young person of color is supported by programs and services, and more importantly, institutional cultures that value and support their mental health. And so what we do at the Steve Fund is not just offer individual-based interventions, but we're really ho um, um, hoping to um, impact the institutional culture, the institutional policies and procedures um, that can sometimes lead to oppressive situations. And so we're really um, concerned with institutionalizing these issues. And so we'll talk about that um, as we go along, but that is who we are. And I want to start this out us out with kind of a, a check-in. If you're in person, go ahead and do some introductions. Um, but if you're online, um, actually, you can't communicate online with each other, I just realized. So um, I will take that part back. But more importantly, I want to know how you're doing today. And I don't want you telling me exactly how you're doing, and I'll explain my rationale for that. But I want you to kind of compare it to yesterday. Are you feeling better than yesterday, the same as yesterday, or worse than yesterday? And so go ahead and use that Mentimeter. Just to give you an idea of some of the folks that we've worked with and worked with in the past and in the corporate sector, we have a long, long standing relationship with Morgan Stanley and have done more interventions uh, and work with them than I can remember. I'm one of the, the uh, experts that continuously works with Morgan Stanley, um, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Sony, Comcast, Pinterest is a, another big supporter of ours, um, uh, Chanel, Abercrombie and Fitch, uh, Peloton, the list goes on and on. Um, what we do know is that the world of work is thirsty for interventions like this. They're thirsty for solutions for how to make our, our settings and our environments not only more inclusive, but induce a sense of belongingness so that every person in our organization feels as if they belong, as if they have meaningful contributions. I'll give you another few minutes to kind of fill this out. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing so I can switch to the other screen. All right. Are you seeing the results there? Okay, and they're coming in. So we see that about 65% of people in our community right now, both in person and virtual, are feeling better than yesterday. That's a good one. Um, about 26% are feeling the same as yesterday. So we're not quite sure. Were they feeling bad to begin with? Are they feeling okay? But they're feeling the same. They're maintaining some stability there. And then we have 9% in our community that are feeling worse than yesterday. And I'm sorry about that. And I Hope that maybe you'll um, take something from this that might actually add to your, to your wellness trajectory. Um, but it's good to kind of think about what is going on in our community. And this is one 
rather um, elegant way of communicating care um, to a community of kind of sharing some vital information and, and communicating that back. Um, let me just put back the original presentation. All right, so now we have that. And so the way that I use this, and I, and I think of this as an intervention, a leadership intervention, um, we know that wellness um, is an issue that has taken on a lot of steam, especially during the pandemic. Many organizations are really concerned with communicating that wellness is a priority to their employees. Some are not quite sure how to do that, above and beyond providing healthy snacks, gym memberships, et cetera. That's great. But that's not going to induce cultural uh, shift changes, right? That's going to add to the environment, but that's not going to change the process. And so what we want to do is change the process of how we work with each other. And one thing that I do um, in all of my classes and my gatherings is that I always start with this kind of a well-being check-in, right? It doesn't even have to take so long. It's taking longer because I'm explaining it, right? And so what you can do is just have this question throw it out there, have folks answer like this, either in person, people can raise their hands, they can share it anonymously. But what you now have as a leader of that, of that group is some vital information about where, how that group is kind of functioning as a, as, a, as a whole, right? So we know our group is doing a bit better than not, right? And so if this was a real work group, I would know that maybe more people in our group are poised to kind of do the things that we need to do to be productive right now, um, kind of carry out the tasks at hand. If it was inverse, and let's say 65% were feeling worse than yesterday, I would know that I might need to augment my expectations for what I hope to get out of this, right? That doesn't mean that we don't work. All that means is that we need to kind of meet people where they are. If folks' energies are down, if they're not feeling so great as a whole, that's going to have an impact on how we're able to carry out the work. And so it kind of helps a manager or a leader set more appropriate and healthier expectations for what the work of that group is going to produce. And so that's how I like to use it. You can even use this as a daily wellness check-in for yourself. And I'll explain that more towards the end of the presentation as we get there. So thank you. It looks like the QR code is working. It looks like the, uh, the, the web address is working and that folks were able to do that. If you weren't able to, please put a, a question in the Q&A so we can help troubleshoot that. <clears throat> now, a little bit more about, about how we approach our work and some of the key assets that we've developed over the eight or nine years that we've been in existence. So over the course of this time, we've been great about kind of gathering the experts, the primary folks out there doing research in this area, doing research on racial trauma, doing research on oppression, doing research on best practices. We've gathered them. We've gathered people from a variety of disciplines. So I'm a psychologist, but we have psychiatrists. We have social workers. We have folks from other um, uh, disciplines that come in and help kind of add to the solutions that we're creating. We have diversity, equity, and inclusion experts, communications experts, people that are experts in human resources. So our team is very multicultural and very multidisciplinary, and that just adds to the magnitude of strength that our assets are able to hold. Um, thought leadership and research. Uh, one of the first things that we realized when we started as an organization is that folks were out there doing this independently in pockets, but not together, working in silos, right? We find that that happens in the world of work way too often, and when we're siloed, we're not able to harness the power of the collective, right? And so what we realized is that we needed to bring folks together so that folks that are doing this work both as researchers and as practitioners in the world of work and higher education can come and share their best practices and can communicate and develop even better practices from their joint knowledge together. And so we uh, do a lot of research in that area, surveys we've done, we do convenings as well, where we bring together people from a variety of disciplines and, and areas to kind of have these thought conversation conferences together. We have a corporate leadership uh, council. Thankfully, we have a lot of of folks who are, are are really who really bought into what we're selling because they realize that what we're selling is something that makes a lot of sense, not only in terms of providing the necessary skills and knowledge to their employees, but also it makes sense in terms of the institutional efforts that we're creating, right? We're not just here to kind of 
um, have Band-Aid fixes. We really want to find what's really broken within the system and how can that be refashioned and reshaped so that it's more functional for all employees and everybody involved in the organization. So we have this corporate leadership council that provides us with another layer of expertise that we're able to filter into the, the foundation of what we do as an organization. And then that goes into our programs and services. Um, you're getting a, a taste of what we do. Um, a lot of what I do and what I've been doing, uh, I'm a educator first and foremost. And so I really get uh, energized by doing interventions like this, you know, really being able to talk through these concepts, through the consciousness raising, and facilitate these various interventions via the workshops to various constituencies, students, employees, um, families, etc. Webinars, trainings, consulting. Uh, we even realize that not everybody has the luxury to attend an in-person or even a virtual workshop. Some people may need a resource at one in the morning and where do they go, right? And that's where we really focus in on building um, a suite of an electronic resources online that folks can access at any time um, in any way. So that's a kind of an overview of some of our assets and what we, what we bring to the table. Um, we also have some, some frameworks, right? So we're not just doing this work willy-nilly. Um, we've done a lot of work. Uh, our first few years were really spent not only in ideating, but in researching, right? We needed to research what is going on out there, right? What's already being done that's helpful? What are the experts saying that is helpful? What are those that are practitioners saying that is helpful? We brought all that information together. And what we first created was an equity and mental health framework for higher education. And then we created a, a workplace equity and mental health framework, which is a number of recommendations that are really aimed to help institutions institutionalize these issues so that they become a fabric of the organization and not just a mere add-on. So we know that in this work, we have to intervene both at the individual level and at the institutional level. And those are kind of, the, those are the programs that we've developed as part of this defund. So this workplace equity and mental health framework is a guide of recommendations. The first thing, right, if, if an organization is gonna make a commitment to making sure that wellness and mental health are a priority for all employees, it should be a part of the mission in some way or a part of the values, right? And so how can an organization make that front and, and first and uh, front and, and forward uh, a priority of the organization? Embed it in the mission, embed it in your objectives, right? Um, engaging employees, right? So we need to know what employees are thinking. You know, many of you probably are leaders in your organization, and I'm sure you have a wealth of information. But me, as someone who tends to lead things more than as part than be uh, someone who is a uh, uh, following, I know that I can't lead without knowing what who what the what the needs are of those who I'm leading are, right? And so we need to engage all of the employees in a constant feedback loop of how they're experiencing the mental and emotional well-being climate of their organization. And we have interventions for helping organizations assess kind of that climate of emotional and mental well-being. Some might even think of it as psychological safety. We're finding that even that well-being check-in that I do communicates that I have an interest, uh, a bona fide interest in your well-being. And what research is finding, actually research that has recently come out, is that when, when organizations do wellness check-ins with their employees, that the employees communicate that they have a greater sense of psychological safety in that organization. And what that means is that people feel like they can bring their full selves into the organization, into the workplace, without fear of retribution or without fear of harm, right? And I, as someone who I mentioned several marginalized identities don't always feel psychologically safe in every setting and do withhold at times. But when I know the organization has a commitment to my well-being, I'm more than likely able to put forth who I truly am, which means I'm going to bring my full self, my full creativity, my full knowledge, and that's just going to benefit the organization even better. So engaging employees continuously within their experience is necessary. Assessing the culture of the company I guess against industry standards. We know that um, DEI issues are, are being taken very seriously in the world of work. Positions are being created, organizations to support those positions are being created. And so now industries are developing their own industry-wide standards for inclusion and belonging. And how does your organization map up to those, right? Or maybe you're a leader in creating them. How can you make sure that you are upholding um, those values um, in terms of the, 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 the company culture? 
building and promoting responsive programming, right? And so that goes into some of the intervention that we need to do on the individual and group level. So based off of those assessments of the climate and the organization, we then give you recommendations for the types of programming that need to be, um, that would be helpful to build within your, your organization so that uh, employees can feel that sense of belongingness and like their mental and emotional well-being is being um, cared for in a serious way. <clears throat> Again, going back to institutionalization, it's great to offer programs, it's great to offer services and webinars, it's great to even hire specialists who are in charge of this. However, if the infrastructure of the organization does not change, if the policies and procedures do not change, then cultural shifts are likely not going to happen, right? And so we need to look at, with a magnifying glass, what is the infrastructure of this institution? What are the policies and procedures that guide us? What are our bylaws, right? And every bylaw, every policy, every procedure can be viewed and assessed via a wellness metric, right? Or a wellness lens. So how, how are we going to be changing the infrastructure? This is where a lot of the, the change is going to be sustained, right? We think about sustainability of these issues, right? DEI issues are only going to be sustained when the infrastructure changes to match those priorities. Empowering company leadership with the capacity, right? Um, sometimes folks are given DEI issues as an extra responsibility on top of what they're already signed up to do, which just kind of eats, eats at their capacity to do their work. Are we doing that? Is that really helpful? Is that really communicating a, a, a standard of care? Probably not, right? And so how are we empowering leaders with true capacity, true skills to support their employees um, in, a, in, in their mental health and well-being, right? Um, commitment to data analysis, that goes back to that, that feedback loop, that continuous feedback loop of assessing the culture of the organization, assessing um, the employees and their wellness, and then assessing the efficacy of the interventions that you choose to employ within your organization. So making sure that we're continuously assessing them, revamping them, updating them. Um, as a scholar in DEI issues, I learn something nearly every day that adds to my knowledge. And so even the, the, the knowledge base of DEI is changing on a continuous basis, which means that our conceptualization of DEI issues are going to also going to change on a continuous basis, which then means that we need to be engaging in continuous cont uh, continuing education regarding these issues. And then one of the, the final things is to engage, mobilize, integrate internal and external stakeholders to ensure sustainability. We hope to partner with you as one of the external stakeholders. We know that it really does take a village, a village beyond our own immediate organizations to carry on this work. Um, some of the work that we do with higher education institutions um, are cohort models where we bring together various institutions to work together. And that's kind of the spirit that we promote within all our work is that we need cross-institutional sharing of information, right? What are the best practices that you're that you're engaging in your organization and sharing that with other people, but also learning from other organizations in terms of what they're doing that, that may work or that might not work. So making sure that, that these partnerships are really solidified. And if you're an organization that has a consumer, we all do, how are those consumers included into this as well, given that they're inevitably going to be impacted by what happens in-house? So that's a brief overview of the recommendations that, that we have in our workplace equity and mental health framework. And you see it's a variety, some things that focus on individual group level of intervention, and then many that focus on the infrastructure and the institutional issues um, that kind of create these issues. So my next intervention is a mindfulness moment, something that I also include in nearly every group activity that I do, I don't care how old you are or how young you are, anybody can benefit from mindfulness. And I want us to think about mindfulness separate from meditation. It's not quite the same thing. You can have a mindfulness moment in a brief three minutes like we're about to do. And I'm gonna explain the very tangible and practical benefits of even engaging in a very brief mindfulness exercise. Welcome to the sober breathing space. SOBER stands for stop, observe, breathe, expand, and respond. Stop whatever it is that you are doing and whatever it is you are about to do and allow yourself to just simply be right here in the present moment. Observe what's happening in your body, noticing any sensations that are present in your body right now.
check in with your emotions, noticing whatever feelings are there for you right now without judging anything, just allowing them to be as they are. Notice where your thoughts are right now, whether they're in the past or in the future or in the present. With the next breath in, gathering your awareness. With the next breath out, bringing your awareness now just to the breath. As best you can, keeping your full attention on the sensations of breathing. Breathing in, I know that I'm breathing in. Breathing out, I know that I'm breathing out. In. Out. Whenever you notice your mind wandering, as best you can, simply bring your awareness back to the next breath. Breathing in, breathing out. In, out. Gathering your awareness again with your next in-breath. Breathing out, expanding your awareness to a sensation of your whole body being breathed. Checking in again with the body. What do you notice? What sensations are present right now? Are they the same or are they different than earlier? Checking in with your emotions. What feelings are present right now? Checking in again with your thoughts. Where is your mind right now? And with awareness, as best you can, responding to the situation, carrying on with your day, shifting out of autopilot mode and into mindful awareness. All right. Well, I hope some folks have already had experiences with mindfulness. This is taken from mindfulnessforteens.com. I'm sure there are no teens with us. I use this with, again, people of all ages. I just find it to be a very useful website because there are a number of other pre-recorded short interventions that you can use um, here as well. This is from Dr. Vo, who is a Vietnamese psychiat uh, Canadian psychiatrist who's come up with this website. Um, so that is one resource. And one reason that I love mindfulness is because that it is very effective in many ways, many ways that we're still learning. Um, but the research is only showing that it really helps with neural integration. Now, what does that even mean? Neural integration is when our brains are operating as they should, meaning that the neurons that are in charge of communicating with each other so that we can do every single thing that we do as humans are, are shooting and firing at the speeds appropriate. What we know is when the brain is stressed, when we're stressed, right, which I don't know a single person alive right now who was alive three years ago who isn't more stressed out than they were three years ago before the pandemic hit us, right? That, is, that stress is still maintained. Uh, what we find is that when our brains are overly stressed, that the neurons actually uh, slow down in their speed. So this is why when you're overly stressed, you might find yourself searching for a word to say that you know what the word is, but you're like, I can't think of it. You might find that your fuse uh, for your anger or for her being upset is shorter, right? And you might be more reactive as a result, right? I'm not sure who else has been there, but I've been there, right? Those are my indications that something isn't going on right for me, but that's because the brain is overly stressed. And what we've found is that by just incorporating a brief mindful moment, this three minutes is all that's needed, can actually help reintegrate those neurons so that they're firing as they should or a bit faster than they were when you were more stressed out. What we're also finding is that there might actually be a contagion effect. And so research on therapists who engage in mindfulness for a few minutes before their sessions with clients when their clients were asked about the efficacy of those sessions, they reported greater results with therapists who engaged in mindfulness than therapists who didn't engage in mindfulness. And what I think is happening is that somebody who does this for myself to ready myself for engagements like this, it puts me in a more um, 
relaxed situation where I'm going to be open to receiving more from others that I'm with because I'm not overly concerned with what's going on in my brain, right? Does that make sense? I hope it makes sense, right? And so what that actually can be is that people that you work with might actually experience you as being more open, right? More there for them, right? Having more capacity more for their humanity in that moment. So neural integration is the outcome of engaging in mindfulness, right? And it only takes a few minutes. And my students are so primed with it that sometimes when I'm just wanting to get into the, the topic of the day and I forget, they're like, oh, Dr. Rivera, you didn't do our mindfulness. We need our mindfulness first. And so people do buy into it um, as, as time goes on. Um, but it's one of those, again, very accessible, practical, and elegant uh, um, um, interventions. Now we're going to get into some consciousness raising. Consciousness raising is an intervention in and of itself. Uh, consciousness raising means that we learn about some information that raises our consciousnesses regarding any specific area. And so what we're going to raise our consciousness of, uh, around is issues in, regarding racial trauma. And just by having that information can help people make sense of experiences that they've been experiencing that maybe they didn't have labels for. It's very helpful as people. We really like to label things. That helps us to organize it, make sense of it so that it's less stressful of an experience. So while I'll never say that racism is not stressful, having some ideas and some knowledge about where it comes from, how it manifests, how it impacts, can help somebody organize their experiences with it that can actually make it feel a bit less stressful. <clears throat> we start with an ecological perspective, right? The ecological perspective is not anything that I created. Uh, we're borrowing from Yuri Bromfenbrenner, who is uh, one of our, our four people in the field of education and psychology who gave us this ecological perspective. Bromfenbrenner was, was uh, really concerned with um, how people develop and knowing that we don't develop by ourselves in a vacuum, that we develop because we are communities, or because we are creatures that live, that are born and live in, in growing communities that we develop via those com community um, aspects. And so it positions the individual kind of in the middle and the individual is having an impact based off of the institutions that they're involved with, right? So that can be school, that can be healthcare, that can be the criminal justice system, uh, that can be economics, right? All these major institutions, it could be literal institutions like the, the specific school that I go to, the specific organizations that I work within, the specific religious or spiritual institutions that I may be a part of, right? And then we're all embedded in various communities. So I have my community of origin. I mentioned I'm from Wyoming. That still has an impact because, again, the historical context is also important to consider. Um, the immediate community that you currently live in, the community that your organization is embedded in, right? That's going to all have an impact on the culture that develops within that institution, which then impacts that individual. And then we have the public policy. That's where Bromfenbrenner really didn't focus a lot of attention on, you know, those public policies, those laws, but not just the laws that are enacted, more so, especially in this day and age when information is accessible via many, many, too many uh, venues and channels, um, that there's just rhetoric around policy, right? Rhetoric of a variety of, 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 um, uh, of natures, um, some that are very damaging for people to hear, right? And so it could be that a law never goes into place, but the rhetoric around it has already had an impact on people. Right. And so it's important to kind of take that into consideration that when we think about what's going on in society, that it's just not just, again, those specific laws and procedures and policies that are passed, but just the discussion around them can lead to some harm. And then we have the historical context. That's one that was also quite not as highlighted in Bromfenbrenner's uh, model, but that a historical context is key especially when we think about racial trauma and where it's developed from, it's important to think about the racial legacy of the country that we live in, right? We have to think about, right, the, the genocide of indigenous people, right? The enforced removal of Africans and, and forced slavery that, that then resulted in the Americas, right? Um, that there's that legacy that it's not actually so far behind us, right? It's only a few hundred years, right? And that we're still contending with the, the fallout, right, the impact of those major um, atrocities. And then we have a lot of other things. We, uh, when you go look at the laws of this country, especially regarding um, immigration and what have you, 
many um, uh, people, uh, Asian Americans, uh, Latino Americans have been targeted via those policies historically from the 1800s to this current day. And it's important to think about that the, the history of legislation regarding immigration, for example, and how that's been translated into oppressions that people of color currently experience. So that historical context is important, not only the, the broader historical context, but our individual histories, right? What's the individual, what's the history of your people? How do you understand how you got to be sitting in the chair that you, you're currently sitting in, right? I know that it took the work of many of my ancestors who didn't have the privileges that I have. I'm the first of my family to get a, a college education. I'm the first to have a PhD in my family. So I'm creating some other um, cultural shifts, but it took a lot of work to get there. And I, and I need to acknowledge that as part of my history. Another reason that we take this ecological model is because for all too long, and I'll be the first to throw my profession under the bus, psychology and psychiatry especially, have pathologized the individual way too much, where people have been led to believe that any depression or anxiety or mental uh, health compromise that I'm experiencing is my fault, right? I'm the one that created it. That's the message that's been communicated time and time again, unfortunately. Um, I flip that. I'm like, it's not individuals that are inherently ill. It's the institutions, the communities, the public policy, the rhetoric, the historical context that are making people ill that are creating these issues that we're contending with, right? And so that's where we need to be working on the solutions, right? Those, those institutions, those communities, those laws and public policies, right? Rather than just focusing on the individual. Please feel free to put in questions in the Q&A if you are in the, um, the virtual modality. If you are um, in person and you wanna ask a question, feel free to unmute yourself. We realize that we don't have the ability to use breakout rooms in um, this webinar function. And so I have interactive activities via Mentimeter that you're going to be able to use, but feel free to, to ask questions um, as they come up. One stark example of this ecological model and how it's come to life is what's been described as the double pandemic that people of color um, experienced over the past few years, right? Um, we know that via the COVID research, a lot that actually stopped. I was updating, you know, the, the percentages of people that were dying from COVID and also that were being infected based off of race. There was a tracker actually being put out there. But once, about a year ago, um, there was not a unified way of capturing this data in our country. They stopped uh, producing that. But time and time again, we found that, that people of color were bearing the brunt of infection rates and of life lost, right? And we also know that they were bearing the brunt of economic livelihood lost as well, of education lost, right? And so um, some would say, oh, that was just the pandemic. Nope, the pandemic, all that did was reveal these disparities that were already existing, right? The US government keeps track of this. Go look at education statistics, employment statistics, like who's represented where, that was already going on. The pandemic just magnified it. Whenever we go through any human or natural made disaster, be that a hurricane, an earthquake, or um, a, a pandemic like COVID, we tend to find that it's the communities of color that bear the cost to life, that bear the cost to economics, that bear the cost to opportunities lost, right? And so that's one reason why we take this ecological perspective, because it helps to ground us in a larger picture of what's going on. What, we, what I find as someone who's done this work for over 20 years is that folks like to get caught up at the individual level of experience. They'll be like, oh, we had a Black president. That means that we don't have any more racism. Ooh, we know that's wrong, right? We know that's absolutely wrong, but folks will use those, ex those individual examples to kind of wipe away the oppressions that currently are being experienced, right? So we know that, that these oppressions still experience and that there are still significant disparities in terms of where people are employed, what levels of employment they're employed at, and how much they're earning. We still know that that is still very disparate. So we're getting into what is racial trauma, very briefly, it refers to the mental and emotional harm caused by experiences with racism and racial discrimination, microaggressions, bias. Um, <clears throat> one of my reframes in the pandemic is that the because of the emphasis put on wellness and well-being in the pandemic, because people were actually able to maybe disengage from the world of work as we once were and kind of maybe take more stock of their own home lives, more of an emphasis of wellness was placed. So we saw mental health stigma go down, which was fantastic. I never in my life thought it was gonna go down as much as I saw it go down over the last three years. We also are 
calling things what they are truly called. Before we might just say that was discrimination or oppression or bias. No, it's racial trauma that we're talking about, right? It's the it's the mental and emotional byproducts of racism and discrimination that people are experiencing. And it comes across in a variety of ways. Um, I'll first talk about dignitary harm, which is probably a term that many of us may be unfamiliar with. It's something that is not really written about. It's on my to-do list to write about it. I was fortunate to hear the critical race theory and intersectionality, intersectionality legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw speak a few years ago, and she brought up this um, concept of dignitary harm, the harm that occurs when people are not fully acknowledged for, nor appreciated, nor affirmed for who they are and what they bring to a situation, right? Um, so think about that. If you, if you feel as if you can't bring your full self into a situation, you might even start to devalue a part of yourself, right? Um, and that can cause harm to our dignity, which is our sense of well-being, our sense that good things to come to us. It's even that sense that that motivates us to pursue, you know, our life streams and opportunities. In my conceptualization, once our dignity is harmed, that probably is going to open up the doors to a lot of other compromises to happen. So we kind of place that front and center as what we're trying to prevent from happening and what we're trying to heal. So internalized oppression, another term that has, has taken a lot of shape. We do a lot of work um, on internalized oppression in our workshops. Um, internalized oppression is the oppression, uh, the, it's the idea that the stereotypes regarding various people based off of race, gender, sexual orientation, ability are so strong and pervasive in society in that and that my, myself as a, as a Latinx Mexican American person encounter, you know, negative messages regarding my culture on a regular basis. If we think about the Southern border wall debate, which should never even be happening when you think about the history of this country and how the Southwest came to be part of this country, uh, which included my family uh, lineage, um, those messages start to become internalized. Even if I don't believe that my people are less intelligent Right? The main messages out there in society are that Latinx people are less intelligent. It comes across time and time again. Part of me is going to start to believe it, right? And that's going to come up in the stereotype threats that I might experience, right? And especially the imposterisms, the imposter phenomenons that I might experience, right? That sense that I'm that I'm a phony, right? That that I don't really have what it takes, and I still have this. It's this voice in the back of my head that has my voice, but it's the voice of the oppressor that's been implanted and that's been maintained time and time again via all these messages that I still encounter on a regular basis, right? That that kind of lead to this internalized oppression. I think that's one of the most harmful forms of oppression when it, when it takes seat within us because we don't need somebody else to trigger that for us. We can do that on our own. Um, it can decrease um, people's ability to seek help. We know that the more microaggressions that somebody experiences in a setting, the less likely they are to seek help from that setting. That makes sense. Why would you want to seek help from a setting that you feel is harming you? Lack of access, right? Lack of access to culturally competent services that we need, right? Basic needs services, right? Culturally competent health care, right, is a main um, issue that we're trying to kind of work against and to promote. Uh, microaggressions, right? The, the if if, uh, if if institutional oppressions are not attended to, I can guarantee you, microaggressions are going to dominate within that setting. Microaggressions is my main area of expertise that I've been studying since be, for over twenty years, since before they were a commonplace word. Um, but but we know that time and time again, the more microaggression what, microaggressions one experiences in their life, the less likely they are to seek out support. From, from people in those situations and the more hostile of a work environment um, they can experience. And then the sense of isolation that can result. So if I'm experiencing all of these things, I'm experiencing my workplace as being hostile, I'm probably gonna feel isolated and alone. I'm probably not gonna feel connected. I'm probably not gonna even be as productive or as satisfied in that workplace. Those are the two main variables that org psychologists study in organizations. Um, in terms of, of uh, outcome variables, right? How productive are people and how satisfied are people? And those two go hand in hand. If folks aren't satisfied, they're not gonna be very productive. Now it's time for me to kind of shut up and for to hear what you all have to say. The next um, question I want you to think about is kind of what are some of the factors that you've come across um, in your own work, in your own life histories that kind of uh, help to create and maintain racial trauma in the workplace? What are some things that are happening there? And here you're going to go to 
um, um, a slide, which I hope it's showing. And if someone can tell me who's gone there, if the what factors impact slider showing. Is that slide showing? Yes. Yes, Lauren? OK, so great. And so this is where I would like you to put in some information. I'm going to take away this slide and go over there. And I'll be able to show us some of our answers so that we can kind of learn from each other. What's going on in our organizations? What are the, the factors that are uh, creating and maintaining it? It can be some of the things that I mentioned already. But there are many other things that I haven't even mentioned that go into the creation and also maintenance right? Maintenance of the racial trauma. How is it propelled? How is it kind of upheld? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Vera. If um, folks on the Steve Fund breakout room, or not breakout room, Zoom and can update the question, I think when we scan the QR code, it's still giving us the first question we had before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good for yeah. 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 So those questions just need to be updated really quickly. It is. It's just not hold up one second. I'm not quite sure. Yeah. I yeah, he just needs to advance it in the program. Oh, that's why. Okay. There we go. Is it coming up now? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Sure. Okay. I had to hit present. Sorry. Okay. I'll show it. So as people input their answers, they're going to come up on this board. And you're no longer sharing your screen, so we lost a QR code. Right? Oh, do folks still need that? Okay, here's for folks who still need the QR code. It's the same one that we've been using. So once you have it once. It should work. Okay, some answers are coming in, so please continue putting in those answers. I'll leave this QR code up for another minute, and then I'll switch to the Mentimeter so that you all can see what your colleagues are inputting. Are you all seeing the screen with the Mentimeter results? Yes. Okay, so I'll read some of them. So these factors, so time and thoughtfulness, social media, mm -hmm. again, that's uh, one of the dominant uh, kind of uh, infusers of a lot of these messages, but also there's a lot of positive things happening in social media. One thing that I teach people to do is to curate their social media. We don't have to accept everything that's coming to us. We can actually block folks. We can choose who we want to allow into those spaces. I find that especially young people are a bit too inviting with, with having um, uh, too many folks that might actually not be helpful for their well-being. Bias, opportunities, representation. Yep, representation matters. If you don't see it, you can't be it, right? That is really important. Leadership, right? Being overlooked and not recognized for accomplishments, preferential treatment, wage gaps, lack of new opportunities given to people of color, organizational policies again, confirmation bias, training, the lack of diversity that might be inherent in the organization, not listening, right? I also train people how to listen to understand as opposed to listening to respond, which is often where we got caught, we get caught up in. If you're listening to respond, that means you're not really listening. Um, uh, company holidays that don't reflect my heritage, right? That's really important to take into consideration. Uh, that's going to send a message about which cultures are appreciated, which ones aren't. Lack of understanding of history of race relations. Again, that historical perspective is necessary for folks to be aware of. Unaware leadership, a lack of resources, a lack of resources. I'll say that time and time again. 
past experiences and thinking only from your perspective, right? Not doing perspective sharing and taking, thinking about, wait, am I only talking to the same people? Who's in my group that I usually go to, right? It's important to kind of seek input from a variety of sources, even those that maybe you might not quite fully agree with. Stereotypes and lived experience bias, increased racial tensions in our society, which pervade, right? The workplace is a microcosm of society. Whatever happens out there is eventually going to happen in the workplace, which is important why we take stock and address when there are major racial uh, tensions and issues that happen in society. How are we acknowledging that in the workplace and the impact of that in the workplace, right? When significant cultural figures die, right? Especially cultural figures of color, right? How is the organization kind of uh, taking stock of that impact on their employees of color? Um, unequal pay, leadership composition, lack of trust. Trust is, is, is paramount. Without the trust, how are we ever going to even dialogue authentically? The lack of empathy, lack of training. Okay, lots of lacks here. Lack of awareness and commitment to DEI, DEI right? It's that commitment part I find is often missing People might be aware of something, but where is the commitment, right? How are we, how are we codifying this? How are we making this an institutional priority? How are we making this a part of our jobs? The lack of people of color in leadership, organizational histories, individual motivations, the demographics, and personal perceptions are some factors. Respect, hierarchy, hierarchies, deadlines, right? Hierarchical hierarchies are always going to. Um, breed upon some kind of um, issues. There's even a, a class of microaggressions called hierarchical microaggressions that have been studied in the workplace, um, which I would encourage folks to kind of uh, take a, a delve into. Communication, isolation, defensiveness. Uh, defensiveness, right? Defensiveness is going to provide that, that barrier that's going to prevent somebody from actually taking in vital information, right? A lack of diversity among senior company executives, ignorance, right? Ignorance means we don't know, right? Sometimes, though, there's purposeful ignorance where people don't actively don't want to know. And how do we address that? A lack of transparency, right? When there's when 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 processes, when procedures are not transparent, when decisions that are made are not transparent, that's not going to lead to much trust. I can tell you that much who has the seat at the table, generational ignorance and intolerance, it gets passed on, right? Who are the leaders, right? Who raised those leaders, right? How did, how did certain um, kind of um, uh, generational thought patterns get passed along? Assumptions, 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 assumptions. We make way too many assumptions. We need to check out our assumptions with reality and with facts. Um, a lack of support. Um, uh, leadership imposes personal values, right? And so if, if they're the only ones making the decisions, if they're the ones whose input is only taken into consideration when developing policies and procedures, then we know that that may be a problem. Lack of leaders that have similar identities. Um, yeah, humoring and bullying, right? Oftentimes, bullying comes across through humoring. Oh, that was just a joke. Well, in my uh, world view, um, every joke has some kind of truth, even if it's a half truth, it comes from somewhere, it serves some kind of purpose. Maybe we don't use humor as our way of connecting unless we actually intimately know somebody. Owners or leaders that impose personal values across the org, right? And so it goes back again to the leaders. Who's sitting at the in the seats of decision making, right? And who holds that power? Are there any comments in the main conference room since you all have the ability to use your voices? that you'd wanna mention before we continue? Not a comment, but more so a, a, a question. Uh, with regards to the intersections of racial trauma and mental health, uh, the U.S. Surgeon General has come out with a framework that is, has a five pillar uh, element that kind of crosswalks very nicely with what you presented here. And I guess my question for you, uh, Doctor, is what's your reaction then, particularly with private sector leaders, to going beyond just the wellness programs to offer mental health services to their workers? In part because of the fact that there have been some concerns in the past about the concern around liability issues. Uh, and given the, the rise in addressing the issues around mental health and God, I'm wondering whether or not you see any changes and then as a follow-up, what the opportunity for public-private sector partnerships? That is a wonderful question. Um, who is speaking, if you can identify yourself? 
My name is Gene Axis. I am the president and CEO for CAC. Uh, today's my third day. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Well, the amazing million dollar questions that you asked. You probably saw me smiling broadly as you were saying about my impression of what corporate people are doing. They're making some efforts but they have a lot of room to grow. I've yet to work with a corporate partner who has actually institutionalized these issues above and beyond, maybe creating DEI positions, maybe offering some, some auxiliary services, but I still have yet to come across an organization that is completely institutionalized. The efforts are being made. We partner with the Surgeon General, so it's it's a, it makes sense that our, our approaches are, are, are quite aligned um, in terms of how we handle these, uh, approach these issues. And we'd, we're lucky to have a Surgeon General of this country who actually prioritizes wellness and understands the unique um, challenges that communities of color face. <clears throat> um, I will say that, that what, what you mentioned in terms of the liability concerns, primarily preventing people from taking further action. I often hear that as an argument, and I know that there are ways of working with that, right? Not working around it, but working with it, right? There are ways of offering very accessible, tangible, practical, elegant resources to your employees without having to be their therapist. No one is asking anybody to be someone's therapist or healthcare provider. What we're asking folks to do is to include a community of care and a wellness perspective in what they do, and then to offer those services from bona fide credentialed practitioners who can, can help them, either if it's in-house or making sure that insurance programs or employee assistance programs are not only um, equipped, but that people know how to access, access them, right? And that there are culturally competent um, um, venue uh, um, um, ways of accessing these these providers and that these providers are, are culturally competent in and of, of themselves. And so um, I know that there are a variety of ways that that we can that organizations can provide very overt help and assistance without kind of crossing that boundary and becoming a mental health provider or without even having to know too much about what specifically is going on for somebody, right? There are boundaries that we still need to uphold and maintain regarding what individuals are experiencing. Um, but we can't let the fear of a liability issue prevent us from addressing an issue that we know is important to address. Because what I'll say is that I'm sure liability issues are already there because we're not addressing them. All right. I hope that helps to answer. I know it wasn't a complete direct answer. It's still the answer that we're forming our, our uh, um, responses to and our interventions to. But we know that our frameworks that we offer are a part of the solution um, to doing this. Um, in terms of what some specific examples might be of, of uh, microaggressions in particular, so these are from students. And so what we do with this defund is we focus on critical transitions. We know that that transitions early on in our work, we realized institutions of higher education weren't aptly um, kind of orienting their students. They were orienting their students to college, but they weren't orienting them appropriately for the world of work. And in the world of work, was kind of just taking them on as any other employee. Maybe they had some kind of first year employee, first time employee program, but not really focusing in on, well, what are, what are young employees of color or first time employees of color going through this transition experiencing? And so they're likely to come with that racial trauma baggage that they, that, that from their history. So from their previous experiences. And so these, um, uh, young people experience this in their classrooms, but I know from my work with employees that they also experience these types of microaggressions in the workplace, right? That perpetual foreigner complex that oftentimes um, Asian American Pacific Islanders and Latinx folks have, um, where they're asked, where are you from? And then they're repeatedly asked followed up questions, no, where are you really from? With the intention being that you don't look like you're from this country, even though this young person is from uh, born and raised in New York City. Um, being a black woman and having an opinion often equates to being angry, right? There are there are emotional um, attributions that we place on people of color that may or may not fit with where they actually are. Um, being racially spotlighted um, is what this next young person is talking about. The limited representation of my race in your classroom or your boardroom or your meeting room doesn't make me the voice of all black people. Time and time again, I still get asked this question. No, what, what, do, what, do, what do Latinos think about this, David? 
I can tell you what David Rivera thinks about this, but I don't know what every Latino thinks about this, nor can this young person um, fairly uh, say what all Black people experience. They can give their own experience. So that's a very unfair position to put somebody in. It actually doesn't highlight them as a person. It actually erases who they are as a person when they're asked just to be the representative of the identity that they're assumed uh, to represent. And the last one I often joke about is being a favorite one of mine, because I can't tell you the number of last names that have been misattributed to me. Nearly every uh, Spanish or uh, surname out there, Rodriguez, Ramirez, Martinez, Gonzalez, Gomez, it goes on and on, so much so that people in my personal networks have made a joke about it as a coping mechanism, um, but that when we don't learn people's names, right, that says something about our willingness to learn who they are. And this happens with first names too, especially first names that aren't as uh, plentiful as David, right? That I really encourage us not to give people nicknames, not to shorten their names, but to really try to learn. You know, our, our mouths are pretty complicated things. We can produce many utterances of speech, even new utterances of speech. And so we can learn how to pronounce things. But time and time again, I still hear young people um, talk, and anybody, even older people, talk about their names being misattributed or, or minimized in some way. And that has an impact on how they, on their, their feeling of, of belongingness and, and being welcome in and it adds to the racial stress that, that they're experiencing. So this racial trauma, we're gonna give you some uh, a document um, that, that kind of explains what racial trauma is. Some of my, my peers um, um, under the leadership of Dr. Janet Helms, who is one of our uh, matriarchs in the field of counseling psychology for social justice and black psychology in particular. Uh, she recently retired from Boston College, but they gifted us with a framework to prepare and arm people of color to, to prepare them for dealing with instances of racism and discrimination. And so racial trauma, it's important to kind of think about what racial trauma really is. I defined it briefly, but what's important to think about racial trauma is that racial trauma is, difficult, is different from other forms of trauma like PTSD and that racial trauma is persistent, right? It occurs throughout the course of one's life. It's not just one event, it's multiple events and it's varied events over the course of one's days, weeks, years of being alive, right? Um, and additionally, vicarious trauma occurs. So me hearing about uh, racial trauma from my friends, me experiencing another Black life being killed, which we don't need to watch that, right? We don't need to watch that, that re-traumatizes people. But that is a form of vicarious trauma, that, that re-traumatization. And then the racial trauma reactions can mi mirror those of stress. And I'll show you a kind of a comparison to PTSD. But unlike PTSD, right, which really is precipitated on one event, this, is, this one that you're experiencing is probably somebody who had some kind of boating or water-based um, uh, accident. This person can probably avoid a boat or a water, right? But a person of color can't avoid their race, right? Or experiences of racial discrimination, right? And so it's gonna be persistent. But just like PTSD, um, some of the symptoms are um, possibly developing um, a negative mood, negative thinking, being on guard and protected, having one's um, senses heightened, right? Which probably just um, induces more cortisol through one's system, which only aids in decreasing overall physical wellness, avoiding specific activities, right? If you have an employee of color who's not coming to work often, maybe it's because they're experiencing uh, racial trauma in the workplace and they're feeling safer at home. It might not be that they don't just want to show up, right? So there are various reasons why people show up and how they show up. Not being able to concentrate, aggressive behavior, loss of interest in things, Developing maladaptive coping mechanisms, which is what substance abuse is, and then sleep disruptions, which I don't know many people that don't have some form of a sleep disruption going on, but this just adds to it and it's persistent. Any questions about what I've just covered before I go into um, describing the, the framework for addressing a racial trauma in one's life? I'm also noticing time. We're a bit behind schedule. I'm going to try to uh, be done with my stuff by 422 so that CHC folks can wrap up things on your end. Any questions? So go ahead. If you have questions, I, I um, just fixed that Mentimeter. So 
you want to input them, I will be able to view them um, here. So if you're in our um, virtual land, you can use the Q&A um, in Zoom or you can um, ask questions here. So feel free to put in your questions there. So I'm going to go into, again, the one of some of the solutions that we offer. And one of the primary solutions that we're asked time and time again, as people hear about this racial healing workshop that we've developed, me and my colleague, Dr. Marsha Liu, who is a protege of Dr. Janet Helm. So we have literally from the authors of this framework um, um, put this together. And we've been doing this for many, many types of organizations, pre-college students, college students, employees. Um, et cetera. And I'm going to go over the, the bulk of what we discuss in this racial uh, racism healing plan that we have helped folks to develop. <clears throat> so, so this is a tool that managers can provide. So again, we're not asking you to be someone's therapist. We're asking you to be someone's support person, right? Someone's wellness support person. And so this is a tool that you can easily just communicate to the entire uh, community. Okay, here's something that we just came across, this racism recovery plan. Um, we find it, it's been found to be very helpful. Here's the document, take a look at it. If you want more information, connect us with the Steve Fund. If you have a group of employees who want us to do a workshop with them specifically on this, we are poised to do that. And so this racism recovery plan um, is seven steps. It starts with having people reflect on how they've responded to racism in the past. And so I myself know that I've responded to racism in a variety of ways, from being very reactive where I've gotten into arguing matches with people about how I've been harmed, right? To less reactive in that way, but more self-care reactive, where instead of yelling at somebody, I go to my community. I have several text chats here, one including my colleague, Dr. Marsha Liu, and whenever I endure a microaggression or some kind of racial tension, I communicate it there and I'm met with affirmation and validation, right? That's the healthier way for me to respond, right? And so what we want people to do is to think of the healthier ways of responding. So in that moment, what might be a healthy way based on your experiences? And, and literally we're having folks write this down. Dr. Liu and I do this as well, and we, we share our plan so that folks can, can see that we're actually using this ourselves. Um, daily upkeep, what are you doing to stay centered, right? What are you doing? And I had another activity for this. Unfortunately, we don't have time to do it. But think about some of the things that you do in your life to stay centered. I wanted us to do some sharing because it can be helpful to hear what others do. But what do you do to stay centered in your life? And be overt about it. I find that folks kind of take a lot of things for granted, right? Eating, sleeping, uh, getting physical exercise sometimes are taken for granted, but those things need to be scheduled and need to be honored as part of our daily upkeep. But what else are folks doing um, to um, stay centered on a regular basis? Are folks engaging in mindfulness? Uh, do they have a spiritual or religious tradition that they're going to for support? Um, are they journaling? Do they belong to a support group? Do they have a therapist, right? There are so many ways that we can maintain our centeredness. One of mine is sleeping behind me as my dog. I know that when She's the one thing that can literally bring down my heart rate with, by just petting her, right? And so I know when that's happening and if I have access to her, which I do more these days because I'm working from home, um, that helps me there. And so having a conversation about that, and I find that this kind of, you can just take this step too and have that as an activity in any of your work groups, just to kind of have an idea of what folks do and to also promote that folks should be taking uh, really um, control over what they do and, and being very overt about it and, and listing it. Um, the next step is to identify stressful situations. What racial events are upsetting for me? I know that for myself, the media was. And so early on in the pandemic, I stopped watching CNN 24-7 like I usually had it on. And I only gave myself um, a half hour in the morning and a half hour at night because I also realized that it's repetitive over the entire day. I don't need to have it on all the time. NPR, one of my safe havens, but still sometimes the news stories um, are not so helpful for me, right? And so I'm being very conscious of the media that I'm taking in, curating my Instagram and my, my Twitter for folks that are gonna affirm me, right? I don't need to have invalidating messages there. Even if it's just somebody playing devil's advocate, the world plays devil enough. We don't need advocates for the devil in the world already, right? Um, whenever anybody uses that as an excuse for pushing against something related to DEI, that's probably telling you something about their commitment to it. So keep that in mind. I'm anticipating early warning signs, right? So what are your warning signs that something might be going awry? Sometimes we don't think of it first. Sometimes we feel it first, 
Maybe we feel it emotionally, right? I know I feel it in my physical body. And so one good thing about this Zoom is that I can see myself. And I notice that if my shoulders start to go up or if I notice that that this is kind of becoming more tense because that's where it starts to happen first is in my neck, that something is not going right for me, right? My heart is the first thing as well. It starts to get elevated. Something is not right. I take stock. What's not going right for me? So what are your early warning signs? That will give us an indication that something is not going right. And then developing the plan. What is your acute response plan? So once something has happened, you know something is not going right, what are you going to do when you start feeling this, right? Can you remove yourself from the situation if you have the privilege to do so? Maybe that's what you're going to do. Maybe you're going to contact, you know, a, a group of, of colleagues or friends or trusted um, allies that, that can that you can turn to for support. Maybe you're going to um, go to Dr. Vo's uh, Mindfulness for Teens website and listen to a three-minute meditation to help bring you down. His voice is very calming and soothing, I find. Um, and so what is your acute response? What will you do in the moment to take care of yourself? And then having a crisis plan. Sometimes the issue that we encountered is kind of the last straw, right? The last straw that broke my back. And now I start having these other feelings. Maybe I have a feeling that I might want to harm myself or somebody else. What am I going to do if it comes to that? Who else am I going to go to contact, right? Um, am I going to go, am I going to contact my employee assistance program? Maybe I already have a therapist, right? Um, crisis text line. There are a number of crisis lines out there. Make sure that your employees have access to them. One is crisis text line 741741. You can text at any time and get met with somebody who's going to help you. Um, but what are you going to do to take care of yourself if should a crisis emerge and you need extra an extra level of care? And then post-crisis recovery. Once, once you've gotten through it, once you're kind of feeling more uh, put together, how are you going to reconnect to yourself? Um, sometimes I do something that's culturally relevant and I love to cook. I'll make enchiladas for myself. I once did that at midnight and I realized I was taking care of myself because I'd been under, undergoing a lot of cultural oppression within that day. And I just needed to, to feed myself my cultural, literally. Some folks will need to do that. But what is your post-crisis recovery going to look like? And what are those strategies? So we take people through an hour, an hour and a half of doing this in much more detail. And folks leave our session with a very tangible plan for how they can address uh, race, racial trauma when they experience it. And just having that plan is kind of like having a seatbelt, if you will, right? Um, uh, you wouldn't, most of us hopefully wouldn't get into our car without putting our seatbelt on because we know that there's a likelihood we can get into an accident. The same with racism, right? I know that me putting on my phone, me stepping out of my apartment, I'm likely to experience some kind of racial issue, right? And so I need to prepare myself with it. Other things you can do to emphasize a community of care, and I put those in quotes, start using that as, as a phrase, right? We want to induce a community of care here, right? Where we are caring not only for the work that we're producing, but the way that we produce that work. What is the process of producing that work, right? That takes into consideration our humanity. So how are folks doing making sure that uh, folks have a balanced schedule, promoting that in some kind of way. Again, college students may be coming from a setting where they're used to a lot of inconsistency, and now they need to develop more of a consistent schedule, so they might need some direction, some mentorship there. Mindfulness, I cannot overly promote it. You probably are sick of me saying it. I wouldn't be saying it if I did not know 100% that it was something that was helpful. Engaging in it on a regular basis, these well-being checks can be a lifesaver. The average time that goes on between when somebody um, starts to experience a wellness compromise, like depression, between when they actually seek help is 10 years. That is way too long for anybody to be living with in silence with something. Um, what we can do, though, is take charge of our wellness by um, doing daily wellness checks. That can be as simple as in your phone answering that question, how am I doing? Better, same, worse thing yesterday, and just putting that in there, right? You might even put an emoji that describes how you're feeling so that you know qualitatively how you're feeling, right? Or you can do use a journal like I do, where every day, again, I only take a few minutes, unless I'm having a real bad day, then I might journal for longer, but I just write briefly, what went good for me today? What didn't go so well for me today? And then I give myself a global rating from one to 10, one being the worst, 10 being the best of how I'm feeling, now, what I do is I don't just, that just, it's not just helpful for that day. Now you review it, right? At the end of the week, I look at my week. How did I do this week? If I notice that there are a lot of like threes and fours and they're not going away, maybe after two weeks or three weeks, I probably should go and seek out some external help. 
As a mental health provider, um, I know that two weeks and a month are often what we use as when something is lasting way too long, right? And we don't want that to then go into 10 years because by that time, it's probably going to develop into a much more serious condition that's going to require a longer course of treatment and a more serious course of treatment. If we can hit it off earlier, it's not going to require that much treatment. And then continually emphasizing strengths. People of color for all too long have been approached with deficits models, right? And some of us bring that into the work uh, because we've been inundated with it in education and the workplace. Um, and so the counter to that is emphasizing strengths. Our strengths are what bring us forward. Our strengths are what actually help us get through our challenges. And so if we can focus on our strengths, that can actually help people to feel better about themselves and can actually help to develop that community of care in a very um, realistic and tangible way. All right. Another thing that we often get asked is that uh, now that I brought up wellness, am I going to have to be the kind of quasi-therapist? No, no, no. Again, we're not asking anybody to be a therapist. Even if you are a therapist, you're only a therapist for those people that you are in a therapeutic relationship with, not for anybody else, not your family or friends. Thankfully, the Active Minds Network, which is a, a, a higher education college network, came up with this very elegant, I use that term often, accessible and practical way of offering support to somebody who is struggling. struggling. It's the VAR method. Uh, the website is here. There's actually more. There's an instructional video you can have there, but it's so simple. Someone comes to you. They're like, uh, David, you know, I've been struggling, you know, with some, with not feeling like myself. You know, I've been feeling more sad than, than, than normal. And I know that's impacting my ability to show up. Validate the feelings. You know, I, <clears throat> I hear you that you're feeling that you're sad, right? Just repeating, right? Just paraphrasing what you hear back is validating, right? I hear that you're feeling sad and that you're bringing that. I'm sorry to hear that, right? Expressing some kind of empathy. Appreciating one's courage for sharing, especially if it's the first time. I thank you for sharing that with me. You know, we need to have more of these conversations. And then maybe you even share how you're doing. And then all you need to do is refer them to a skill or a support. You don't need to be the one that fixes it for them. And oftentimes folks aren't looking for you to fix it. They just want to be validated. They want to be heard. They want to be recognized. But maybe you refer them to Dr. Vo's mindfulness website. Maybe you refer them to the racism recovery plan. Maybe you refer them to the VA, to this very method so they can help other folks out, right? But providing them with some skill um, or resource can be very helpful. So we are... Just at 422, I know that um, CHC had some things they wanted to do, but I also want to be available for any questions. This last Mentimeter is um, about what you will do. I really encourage you to fill that one out. So what will you do as a product of being here today? This is where you kind of make a commitment. So please do this. I'll also share this with CHC and they can share it out. But what will you do as a product of being here, of kind of taking in this information? Now, if there is time, I'm more than happy to take questions, but I understand if you need to kick me out. Thank you, Dr. Rivera. Any questions from folks in the room? Anything that resonated at all that we want to talk about? I have a question. Yes. Um, hi, I'm Linda Ireland. I used to be on the board here at CHC, and I really appreciate your conversation today. And we've spent, um, you've, you've given us a good snapshot into what organizations can and should be doing to support mental health for people of color and youth of people of color in their organizations. And my question is, um, maybe I'm asking you for a state of the state. Um, are there organizations that you admire for how effectively they are doing this job? Um, or, and, and if you would give the condition of our employers a score, I'm guessing it wouldn't be very high, but I'd love, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, and so I mentioned Morgan Stanley as being one of our main supporters. So they, 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 they ponied up with finances. They've given us quite a bit of money to make sure that we're able to have the financial capacity and resources to do what we're set out to do. And so they have ponied up with the financial resources They've done structural things within their organization, and they've committed to a long-lasting, uh, a long-term relationship with us, so that we can continuously help advise and 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 help help them in their process of making sure that employees of color and their wellness and well-being is 
uh, uh, forefront and central to what they do. So I would say that Morgan Stanley, you know, in, in my experience is um, one of those exemplars in terms of what a, a, a company with resources can do um, to not only address these issues, but to also have an impact more globally speaking. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I can give a score though. I, I, I would shy away from giving folks a, a score. <laughs> I'm more of a qualitative researcher. And so I'm more about, I think it's more helpful to, to have the qualitative information as opposed to a number. Other questions? I have a question, but I just thought the well acknowledged that was a great easy thing to do in team meetings that I'm going to try to do moving forward. And I heard something a little different, but a couple of years ago, where people could just kind of throw it out there and then say, okay, I put it behind me and now I'm ready and present to move forward in the meeting. Because sometimes you have to learn things. And I think we're just going to start doing what, that with the team just to say, better than yesterday, same as yesterday, worse than yesterday. And if we need to address something, or we have our meeting or get to work that that's just a nice reminder so appreciate it exactly right and it's um thank you for sharing that for those of you that may not have heard on the the virtual component but that somebody is, is practicing some of these things doing the wellness checks and knowing that again it doesn't have to um take over the entire meeting but it's just serving as a temperature check and it gives people the ability to just say this is how i'm doing and this is how i'm showing up and now you know, and now we can move on with the work that we have to do. Or if there's something that needs to be said, give the opportunity for them to say something, but it does not have to take over the entire meeting. Um, honestly, it's just good to be acknowledged, right? Sometimes that's all I need to know is that you know that something is not quite right with me. We can move, we can work, we can work together now. We can move on. One of the things that resonated with me was the name comment. Because um, when I, I have a very West African name, Adelaide Crunchy Apia. <laughs> it's a very West African name because I am West African. And when I first came to the US, I had a teacher ask my mom to shorten my first name so that the school could better pronounce my name. And it's funny because I've done now, everyone calls me Adele so much so that if someone says my actual full name, it almost doesn't register. You know, so it's funny how. Um, folks are able to make other people feel comfortable so much so that you neglect your identity, right? Um, I always say if I have a daughter, I'm going to name her Adelaide just so I can say it, but that's another <laughs> I love that. I love that. Yes. And you're so right. For all, you just, that, that dynamic that you spoke about for all too long, people of color, women, queer people, people with ability issues have sacrificed their own comfort so that others can be comfortable for all too long. And when that's going on, we know that something is not going quite right in our organization. Any other final thoughts or comments? Well, thank you so much, Dr. Rivera. Well, thank you so much. Um, if you at all, here's another QR code to give us some, some feedback. Please share your thoughts. I really appreciate you allowing us into your space to share what we do. We obviously believe wholeheartedly in what we do, and we hope that we can create some partnerships with um, some of the organizations on the call today. Great, thank you. And thank you to those in the room. We'll share out everything that was shared today. And um, I don't know, if Tom, or Tom, if you have anything else to say before we close out. No, I think, again, I just appreciate, uh, Doctor, your, you know, your presentation and appreciate even more what the C Fund is attempting to do because, you know, this is, uh, we hear what you hear from companies all across the country is probably the number one thing that we get asked about in terms of engagement with employees is how do you deal with some of these issues so people are looking for tools they're looking for you know practical solutions and it sounds like your approach is very straightforward so again uh you know from and, and i think it's just the beginning of our relationship i look forward to a long and very a productive relationship where we can learn from you, we can introduce you to companies, and you know, maybe in a few years, your presentation is going to be a very different one because of the progress that's being made. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. All right.